Okie doke. Welcome, everybody, to our... Uh, uh, look, look, this is a really exciting webinar for me, this one, because, and it's not just because I get to sit and listen for a change rather than talk all the way through it. I'm really excited because we've touched on a, an issue here that I think that is really a, a pertinent one for so many people that are in the real schools community. And, um, and it's the whole idea of what's in our kids' lunchboxes. I, I obviously get around the country you know, providing advice and working with people to build process and to build strategy around making sure that we have you know, high levels of engagement and you know better level better standards of student behavior in the classroom and um, and that's all well and good because you know that what we know about social and emotional development in kids is that schools are responsible for around they reckon the the, the most standard mark here is around 30 percent of the social and emotional development that goes on with our kids is it comes out of schools which i reckon is a pretty a pretty decent chunk to work with but then we also have the the dynamic of you know what about the other 70 percent and we're, what's happening there and there are very few controls and sometimes only a little amount of impact that we can have in in, the, in what's happening when the, the kids aren't face to face to us. Uh, the one little overlap, I suppose, in uh, what happens at home and what happens at school would be the lunchbox, you know, that, that comes from home but it's consumed and it's used at school. So that often means that this is a, an area that teachers have a, a significant frustration around because you know, so regularly the kids who we're, whose behaviour and whose engagement we're most concerned about are the, are the kids who are presenting with the, the you know the wrong fuel, the wrong um, you know the, the the wrong things in their lunchbox and the the wrong um, you know the, the the wrong opportunity I guess is what we're talking about here to be able to improve and their capacity to be able to improve that behaviour is reduced by what's what's coming along in their lunchbox, and so we know it. We know that there's a, a little problem there, um, but what do we do about it? And um, I know that so, so many teachers that I've spoken to lately have said, look, this is a problem. You know, I've got kids coming to school with the wrong foods and after lunch when they eat it, we know they lose it for a little while and all that. You know, um, but we don't know how to talk to people about it. We don't know how to talk to parents. So thus, I went to Lisa. And Lisa Renz, your guest presenter today, I'm going to hand over very shortly to Lisa. And, um, and, and I asked Lisa to come along because I'm certainly no nutritionist and, um, and Lisa is. So Lisa's an accredited practicing dietitian and her business, Body Warfare Nutrition, has, uh, is really going along in leaps and bounds and her advice in this area is something that I rate incredibly highly. And so I thought rather than me steal Lisa's stuff and, uh, and come along and talk to you, I reckon it would be a, a more valuable thing for everybody on the webinar today if we got Lisa in directly. So we're going to hand over to Lisa in, in just a few minutes, but what I want to do first is my flight attendant impression because we do have, one of the things I did notice today, we've got quite a few uh, new people to a real schools webinar. So um, what I want to do first of all is just remind you about the ways that you can engage. We want today to be a very engaging experience for you. We want it to be something that you're um, that that isn't a passive experience where you sit back and just receive all of the information, but you can get involved too. And there are a few key ways that you can do that. So I want to go through those very very quickly. Number one is you can put your hand up. So you'll see that on your little control panel there that you've got through GoToWebinar that there is a you can see one symbol that looks like a hand and if you click on that symbol what will happen is that we'll know and uh, your hand will go up and we'll make sure that either you know Lisa or myself who's going to be on board and Chris who's also our, uh, our Real Schools Admin Manager she's on board again today so she's going to be uh, doing the behind the scenes work for us again today so one of us will see and that means that what we'll do is we'll look to unmute you and if you have a question as we go along I know Lisa's really keen for everybody to uh, to engage and to you know, have their say as we go. So if we hit an interesting note, then by all means put your hand up and we'll uh, unmute you and hear your question. Uh, another thing that you can use on the, the webinar today is the question box. What we're asking is that if you've got a, if you use the question box that you can see in your control panel there, then that might be because you've got some sort of technical difficulty or you're not quite sure how to, you know, how to do something. Um, and so Chris and I are going to keep a really close eye on that box during the webinar today. And if you need a hand with something around just using the webinar today, then by all means use the question box. But if 
you've got something that's about the content that you're experiencing today, then can I suggest you use the chat box? Uh, the chat box means that if you make a comment or you ask a question, that we'll all see it. Um, because the truth is, if it's pertinent to you, there's a likelihood that it's pertinent to more than you. So let's share that question, let's share that thought, and if we get the opportunity to you know, really tailor the webinar today by, by, uh, by the input that you provide, then, uh, then we're definitely going to do that. So remember that, the control panels there, Lisa I know is going to be asking you to interact as well through some polls, and, uh, and we'll make, to that, make sure that today you get everything that you're looking for out of our webinar. So so it's time for me to hand over and stop the talking. So what I'm going to do very quickly is I'm going to unmute Lisa and I'm just going to say, hi Lisa, have you got me? I've got you Adam, how are you? Yeah, really well. So thanks heaps for coming along today. We're really appreciative of your your expertise and your thought leadership in this area. It's really important to us that we, uh, that we in schools we don't get the chance to look outside the bubble very often of our own schools. So to have an expert like you come in and provide some cutting edge advice for us is, is really important. So thank you so, so much for the time that you put aside today. That's a pleasure, Adam. It's great to be here and be able to share the knowledge. It's good. All right, good, good. So I'm going to unmute myself now, hand completely over to, I'm sorry, I'm not going to unmute, I'm going to mute myself now and hand completely over to you, Lisa, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to the webinar myself, all right? Excellent. Okay, sit back and enjoy this one, Adam. <laughs> well do. Okay, so good afternoon, guys. I'm guessing it's perhaps uh, the end of a busy day for you, so I really do appreciate you being here. What we're looking at today is the Warrior's Guide to the Lunchbox Wars and uh, sort of a bit of an overview of nutrition and how it impacts students but also teachers because uh, basically when we're talking about healthy eating, we're talking about everybody. So I would hope that as you are listening around students and what's good for performance and learning that you would also be taking some on for yourself as well which is always a, a double use for the information. So I've been a dietitian for the last 15 years and prior to that I was actually a teacher. So I was secondary phys ed and maths so didn't get a whole lot of look at lunch boxes I guess but um, not being in the primary school system but certainly my children are in the primary school system now so uh, do get to talk to teachers and, and things about that so know a little bit but would certainly love to hear your comments as we go through the webinar. So we're looking at what we're going to be talking about today. I want to have a little bit of a look at performance enhancing foods and, and performance enhancing practices. So what are those foods that actually do help learning? What are those foods that actually do help peak performance? Um, so we'll go through that. Then have a look at the, some of the problems that, that we see and I guess a couple of the problems that I really think are important as well. Um, and they may not be what, what you're expecting, so stick around, but I'm also interested in your comments on that one. And then if you are concerned about a student, um, that certainly the behaviours coming through aren't any good or the learning is impacted for some, somehow and you think that diet might have, a, have a, a reason behind that, then let's have a look at how you actually can have the conversation without actually tackling the parent and actually get an outcome that works for everybody because ultimately your concern is going to be for the student so the outcome is going to have to benefit the student but it, I get it's a touchy subject so we'll have a go at working our way through that. But the first thing I would like to do is a poll um, and to get a little bit of an idea of who we've got on the line so that's uh, always important and I know that Adam does this each time to have a look and see so if you can see the poll open on your screen then just click in as to who who you are because that will have an impact on the kind of role you have here I guess and we have a few people filling in now thank you we've got a few more people so we're looking at some um, really a nice across the board um, of roles here and I think that that, that is a good thing. People need to be supported in how they, you know, if, if you're a principal you need to support your teachers and everything. Thank you for doing that. So we've got obviously 8% principals, some assistant principals, leading teachers, a lot of teachers and some support staff. So thank you for that and I hope that we can get your input from each of these different levels would be fantastic. Okay, we will move on. So, 
I've just got to do a different moving on, I think, to start with. All right, so if we're looking at performance enhancing foods, so what we've got is that how your nutrition and your input actually has quite an impact on all of these areas. So learning and decision making, it has an impact on your immune system and then also of course in the prevention of chronic disease and ultimately peak performance. So it's kind of like a, a secret weapon for peak performance if you think about nutrition. So eating well does allow you to function at a higher level and we'll be going through a little bit of that today. So if you're looking here, when we're looking at decision making and immune systems, you're looking more at the micronutrients, so the vitamins and minerals, and as we move out, it's more about the macronutrients, so that is the protein, carbohydrates and fats that become important as well. So we will be focusing a, a fair amount of our time on the learning and decision making part of things, but when we're looking at the healthy eating, of course, we are looking at how it's going to improve immune, in, immune system responses as well as preventing chronic disease. So it touches on everything there. So we actually have a little bit of a look at the brain and, and learning. So they've actually um, come to decide that the brain is actually 60% fat. And of course, there's very active development when you're around th up to three years old and laying down those new pathways of learning. And again, in adolescence, there's quite a surge of um, development and there's certainly the research is showing that diet is likely to be a significant influence on the brain capacity during this stage of life and obviously through primary school as well there's lots of learning that's happening so the brain is consisting of neurons or brain cells and these develop dendrites or those little fingers as you learn and when two dendrites link that that is a learning um, and then when it creates a synapse and so that's a, a symbol of higher learning there. Now this connection is weak at first, but it strengthens as you practice and learn. So the stronger the synapse, that's a sign of more practice and more developed learning. Now the point of this is that omega-3 fatty acids or omega-3 oils have actually been shown to improve synapse plasticity. So that means that omega-3 oils um, have the ability to for these synapses to change and to consolidate learning. So here our diet has a big impact on our even our ability to learn at this cellular level. So if we're looking at what these oils look like. We've got the omega-3s that are found in the fish and seafood. So particularly oily fish like sardines, salmon, mackerel and some tin tuna. Um, they are the biggest sources of these omega-3s and they're also in smaller amounts in some vegetable based products like canola oil, black seeds and walnuts and to a certain extent in, in chicken and beef. So we definitely need these good fats for good brain function. Um, and I think on the flip side it's really important to note that these foods that are higher in saturated and trans fats, so these are the products down the bottom here where you've got fatty meats, cakes and pastries, I guess the, the butters and the higher creams, higher saturated fat, in actual fact what they have shown to do is to block the nerve transmission, so to decrease brain function. So what we have here is not only omega-3's ability to improve it, but the saturated fats to actually impede our brain function. So one study recently was looking at consumption of saturated fats actually being associated with a decrease in memory and reduction in brain functioning that could actually lead to an increased risk of Alzheimer's. So this is really important research against having too much of this kind of fat in our diet. Another little point was that a diet that's high in monounsaturated fats, so that is things like canola oil, olive oil, avocados, that it actually increases the production of a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine and this is critical for learning and memory. So they're thinking that this is this loss of acetylcholine production in the brain that actually leads to memory problems associated with Alzheimer's. So what we've got here is certainly a worthwhile investment in having some of the good oils and less of the bad. Other things around omega-3s is that some of kids with um, ADHD are actually more likely to show symptoms of low omega-3 levels. So that's things like dry skin, dry hair, excessive thirst, and also just have lower levels in their blood generally. So 
other things too with kids with reading difficulties. So these children may benefit from a supplement of a, a fish oil supplement. Now there's been research is a bit mixed. However, I guess the good thing with a fish oil supplement is that they are considered safe for children. Um, at this point, I would like to say that fish oil supplements are really quite safe for children and adults and particularly if you don't eat fish um, then it might be something to consider. However, if you're looking at other vitamins and minerals via a, a vitamin mineral supplement then that's not such a great practice. Um, around the other vitamins and minerals we see the benefits that come with the, fruit, the food not just the vitamin in isolation and in fact some research has shown that having a multivitamin when you don't need it actually leads to poorer outcomes so that's just a little bit of a note there but an omega-3 or a fish oil supplement could be something that's um, worth investigating in your kids perhaps with ADHD or even having reading difficulties so that's some interesting point there. So if we're looking at it can actually eating well improve your academic performance and this is where I guess the schools have a vested interest because it, it is in fact that, that if a poor diet showed lower academic performance in comparison with healthy eating. So it does become your business as such. So when we're looking at the diets that, that improved academic performance they showed they had fruit, vegetables, milk and fish and also breakfast was a feature as well as regular meals. So these were the things that have come out of the research. So if we're talking about the micronutrients or the, 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 yeah, the vitamins and minerals that help with this, we've got folate which is found in a lot of vegetables. So things like asparagus and spinach and broccoli and fruit contains folate as well as legumes so your chickpeas and your dried peas and lentils, cereals nuts and even Vegemite has folate. So folate's coming through as a, an important thing for academic performance as well as iron. So that has implications for kids experimenting with vegetarian eating if they're in the high schools that sort of might happen um, because the iron from meat is much better absorbed than the vegetable based sources. But what we know is that a healthy diet does have an impact a on learning and, and ability to learn on, at the brain level but also when getting it in um, to improve academic performance. So let's just have a little bit of a look here. This is the uh, healthy eating pyramid. It's actually the new one that Nutrition Australia has brought out. So it was literally I think in the last month or two. You may have seen it. The things that um, are different to the last one uh, that it's got the fruit and vegetables down the bottom which I think is wonderful because fruit and vegetables is something that we all need to concentrate more on. A study just released in the last week showed that only 1 in 20 Australians are actually achieving the, the, the recommended serve of vegetables each day so this is certainly going to be impacting our kids but also ourselves and the, the parents at school. So two fruits and five different serves of vegetables each day is what you're after. Now the next difference in this pyramid is that the, the carbohydrates have been moved up but I think it's important to note that the macronutrients, so the carbohydrates, the protein and the fats are still here in the same order as they always have been. I was at a, presenting at a conference, an eating disorder and obesity conference in May on the Gold Coast and one of the workers who goes out to schools was a little concerned because she said, one of the teachers said, oh I understand that paleo is the new way of eating so I want to just be very clear that nutrition science does not recognize that carbohydrates are bad and are we talking about that um, in a little bit more detail because I think that they are very important part of healthy eating. So we've got the, the protein in its place, the, the dairies and the, the, the meats in the same place. We don't really need to be sort of striving to get more of that. We, we do have enough in the diet and the healthy fats are at the top. A major difference in this part of the pyramid or in this new pyramid is that it's not looking at the sometimes foods anymore. It's assuming that they're a part of a diet but it is basically showing you what is a healthy diet um, and considering that you limit your sugar and salt intake as that's not needed for a healthy diet. So it's taken off all the takeaway foods but still I guess the way I practice is saying you know they are part of life so they are there but we need to be concentrating on eating healthy foods most of the time. 
So let me just get into the carbohydrates a bit here because I know that they've copped a lot of flack and yes, there are bad carbohydrates but there are also good carbohydrates. It really is a spectrum and on the here you've got the whole grain high fiber side of the carbohydrate story and then of course you've got the low fiber, high fat, high sugar side. I did eat those melting moments by the way so I'm not against them. It's just about they are need to be put in place sometimes as opposed to the everyday. One thing to remember is that carbohydrates break down to glucose, all of them, doesn't matter if it's a melting moment or a grainy bread, they all break down to glucose and glucose is actually our brain's preferred source of energy. So we're designed to burn glucose um, as, as our preferred energy source. So, but it is definitely about getting in the, the good ones as opposed to most of the time. And low GI carbohydrates will actually assist you by having get, providing a lower result on your blood sugar level. So low GI is low glycemic index, which means when I eat this food, what does it do to my blood sugar level? So if it's low GI, it means you don't get such a big peak in your blood sugar levels, so you get energy over a longer period of time. And the benefit is that you feel fuller for longer as well. So it doesn't just go into your stomach and out into your bloodstream, it sticks around and helps with hunger management as well. So Certainly a good, healthy, low GI carbohydrate is part of an everyday diet, a healthy diet. One tip for you, the quickest and easiest way to pick a healthy carbohydrate is basically to say what is its dietary fiber content. So if you're looking at the fiber, dietary fiber per 100 grams, the higher you can get, the better. If you're looking per serve, then anything greater than three grams per serve is going to be good. But certainly you can get up to five, six, seven grams per serve and that is getting healthier and healthier. So the dietary fiber is a quick tip on how to choose the best carbohydrate. But if we're bringing this back to brain function as well, certainly the brain function is affected by our gut bacteria. Now, if we're thinking about gut bacteria, we're talking about, I guess, probiotics where we take a probiotic to have gut bacteria in our gut, but a healthy diet naturally populates a healthy gut population of bacteria. So what we need is good prebiotics, which is a, the bacteria food. So if you're not feeding the bacteria what they need, then you're not going to have the good bacteria in your gut, and that is going to have an impact possibly on your brain function. They're looking at its link with autoimmune diseases and autism. So it's early stages of research, but this prebiotics and the bacteria food, they come from fruit and vegetables, beans and legumes, whole grain cereals and bread. So if you're cutting out carbs or, or eating paleo, so not having the legumes or any of the grains, then you could potentially be having quite a negative impact on your gut bacteria, which is going to affect a lot more than we actually know at this stage. So that's an important thing on the carbohydrates. So if we're looking now just at practices that are going to be performance enhancing, the first thing and the really most important thing is eating breakfast. So having breakfast every day, what we know is that it will improve your concentration. So this does have an impact for your kids and I know that often that is something with students that are coming to school without breakfast. We know that improves concentration and that children or everybody who eats breakfast has a better chance of getting in the recommended daily intake for their vitamins and mineral content that they need to reach for the day. So breakfast is a brilliant start. This one here on the screen, you've got some whole grains and just on a little aside, recent research was saying that if you have start the day with a bowl of whole grain cereal, then you have a 9% decreased chance of premature death and a 5% decrease of heart death. So again, the role of healthy carbohydrates coming in here. So they, they can be part of a, an excellent breakfast strategy. Plus having some milk in there. Milk is an excellent um, part of a snack or a meal because it's a good, good breakdown of protein and carbohydrates to help you feel full and give you some energy. So eating breakfast is a really important way to start the day for everybody. And the next thing is having regular snacks, regular meals and snacks. So kids particularly only have little stomachs and so they can't actually get in all the recommended daily intake unless they are eating fairly regularly. 
And I had a mum comment to me the other day saying, oh, you know, the healthy fruit snack is really good because it gets my child to eat a piece of fruit, which is excellent, but then she doesn't have to eat lunch because she's so busy because she's already had her fruit. So that I would suggest it's great that she's eating a piece of fruit at the healthy snack, however, that it is also equally important to be eating lunch as well because if you don't eat lunch, then you overeat at afternoon tea, which tends to be those snackier foods and then you're not as hungry for dinner. So regular meals and snacks really sets up a whole good practice for peak performance. Thinking about water, it is, you know, I guess a, a big part of our bodies are water. It is certainly a low kilojoule input and it is certainly the healthiest fluid that we can be looking at and it is important part of a performance enhancing practice to be making sure that you get enough water in for the day that you're drinking fluids regularly throughout the day with water being the best one. Now thinking about sleep, um, listening to a webinar last night and one of the, the, the things I picked up was that one night of poor sleep can actually decrease your immune system's responses by 25%. So that is, sleep is a really vital part of maintaining good health. And I know when I've seen children in the past, um, oftentimes I'm really surprised that they have no set bedtime. So basically they, they're on their computers till all hours of night, the night, not getting to bed on time. They may be snacking later at night, they're certainly not getting enough sleep and then they're not having enough time to eat breakfast in the morning. These kids were coming to see me because they were concerned about their weight, or their parents were concerned about their weight. So we also know that getting a good night's sleep means that the hormones responsible for maintaining weight actually do come out when you're sleeping deeply. So sleep is a very important part of a performance enhancing practice. And of course this one, will that won't be any anything surprising to you, but the screen time. So what we do also know, research has shown that if you watch more than two hours of television or screens a day, you increase your chances of chronic disease, you increase the risk factors, increase the, the chances of becoming overweight. It is actually a risk, risk, health, risk factor for poor health. And I was actually at the um, eye specialist with my son recently and she said, introduced this concept of screen time versus green time, suggesting that for those people particularly with short sightedness, that taking regular breaks and equaling up your screen time versus green time is good for eye health. And what she meant by green time was being outside. So it's not just the screens, but it's the artificial light that has an impact on our eyesight. So getting outside and of course that in itself, even standing up, the chair being the number one health problem at the moment that we've got, that they're sitting down too much in front of a screen. So remembering to try and balance out the screen time and green time and encouraging yourself and your kids to be standing up regularly um, and moving away from the screen. So these are just gorgeous pictures of healthy lunch boxes. Adam said, I'd like them to know what a healthy lunch box looks like. And these pictures are beautiful. I actually contacted the lady in America. You can tell it's American because of the delightful orange cheese that goes with the tomatoes there. She said, yep, go for it. Happy for you to use these. And they are gorgeous. I, I like them mainly because, you know, they have some grainy carbohydrates in, in the sandwiches. Be nice if these wraps were a whole grain wrap. Um, as opposed to a white. They've got the vegetables, they've got the fruit. Now also having some dairy in and even having some biscuits in. These are occasional foods and occasionally they can be in the lunch box. That, that's not a problem. I think it's also important to have that balance, that there's, there is a balance. They don't have to be, biscuits don't have to be in there every day, sweet biscuits, um, but they can be in there sometimes. And certainly what we, the water is the ideal drink. Um, as far as fruit juices, I'm not, not such a big fan of fruit juices. Basically the way I see fruit juices is that they are fruit without the fiber um, and plus you know concentrating the sugar. So I would suggest that fruit juices are a sometimes food. But interestingly, you might be surprised to know that flavored milk actually is not a bad snack for kids and it's not a bad part of, of a lunch. If the research showed that actually kids who drank flavoured milk achieved a higher daily intake of calcium, potassium, phosphorus and iodine than those that didn't have milk at all. And in fact, it actually went to say that the study found that drinking milk from a glass or a cup 
was associated also with higher levels of magnesium. So I'm not suggesting that kids have three or four big M's a day, but I certainly am suggesting that a milk Milo after school or or even if it can be in the lunchbox is a perfectly acceptable um, snack and part of a healthy diet. Uh, it's the, the the other interesting part of this study was that the kids did not have it did not impact on their body weight. So they were the same weight as other kids. They just had a better quality of diet. So flavored milk is not off the menu. It is actually not that's not too bad as part of a healthy snack. So if I'm looking at this and running a second poll, I'd really like you to now have a look and, and tell me what are the, the things that you find are the most problematic issues for you at, in your school or in your classroom. So is it, it, if you look at people and worry about are they eating too much, are they not eating enough? Is it all about the lunchbox content? Um, is it unhealthy drinks? Um, kids not eating breakfast? And basically what we've got at the moment looking through, I mean I guess as far as eating breakfast, are you, there is a few people coming in there too. So definitely definitely the, the lunchbox content is going to be the most obvious thing, isn't it? So we seem to have some changing stuff, but 100% of people thinking, yeah, the lunchbox content, I guess that's the stuff that's in your face all the time, looking at that, and unhealthy drinks, 38% not eating breakfast, and a bit of over and under eating. So it's, it's kind of fairly well across the board. Thank you very much for that, and it's... Um, yeah, it just does show that there's some there's some work to be done. So if we are looking at the battles worth picking, so we're having a bit of a look and saying, right, oh, what what do we need to be looking at? I, I know the packaged snacks are going to be high on your list, and looking at that poll result, you know, 100 100 percent the, the lunchbox content. It's going to be the chips in there. It's going to be possibly the cordials. I don't know about soft drinks, but perhaps no fruit, chocolate, biscuits, cakes, that kind of stuff. Now, certainly um, these things, they tend to be high in either saturated fat and salt, or they tend to be a high GI carbohydrate, so low in fiber and high in sugar. It's absolutely a fact that they are unhelpful in the lunchbox if we're looking at those the, the research around what helps learning, that's definitely true that they are not going to be useful for health. As far as from a teaching perspective, I think that the best thing to be looking at is going, the concept of everyday and sometimes foods is really useful here. What's unhelpful is good and bad. Labeling foods good and bad really just does set up the bad foods to be actually, you know, people want to eat bad foods because there's something that they shouldn't be doing. You know, there's that covert element in there. So sometimes an everyday is really the better concept to use and to reinforce that to your class. Totally agree with you, and as does research. The, the statistics showed that children are actually getting 41% of their daily energy needs from discretionary foods. This is pretty horrendous. So it's not only the lunch boxes where it's happening, it's also happening at home as well. And it, it's and you know as adults we're not actually doing much better. It, it was 30 it was 33%. I think just around a third of our adults intake is around these discretionary foods as well. So but worse for kids. Now, so sugar although it really is not sweet poison, it, it's 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 not also an essential nutrient and it, what can happen is that with kids having smaller stomach capacities, it pushes out space in their appetite for other healthy foods. So it's definitely a sometimes food. It can put holes in your teeth. It does add to extra weight gain um, and it is something that that is worth considering, particularly if you're noticing that there's some impacts on the kids' behavior. I think that's the that's the thing, and we'll talk about that later. That is the area you could have some impact. And they're probably what you see the most, these packaged snacks, um, but will possibly be the most controversial to tackle with parents. These are the things that I want to talk to you about. The energy drinks. So, you know, they're, they're big and high in caffeine, um, and they're, I'm guessing, probably more popular with the, with the adolescents, but you might be seeing some of them in the primary school. So high levels of caffeine, they can range from sort of 30 milligrams of caffeine up to 150, as you can see, and those pictures down there, those drinks have about 80 to 90 milligrams. Now, there is really no guidelines for caffeine, but I did find this one coming from the States that suggests that 
children should limit their caffeine intake to 45 to 85 milligrams per day, so depending on body weight. So that means that if a smaller kid is having a can of any of these energy drinks, they're possibly doubling their caffeine intake right there and then. So you know, if caffeine can become a problem if, if kids are showing signs of irritability or an inability to sleep, um, stomach upsets, and also to be remembering that caffeine is present in lots of soft drinks, chocolate, also teas and coffees. So it is definitely recommended that kids under 18 do not have these energy drinks. Um, so I'd be interested to know, even just with a with a hands up or anything in the chat box, if there is, you know, if that if that's something that is a concern for your the energy drinks is a concern, or are they in their school canteens? Because that would be even more worrisome. So I guess around um, soft drink, I'll just keep going and we can talk about that if there's something that comes up. Soft drink, they contain lower levels of caffeine but often more sugar. Uh, and I was commenting on some research a couple of years ago that one in five prep children have soft drink after school every day, which is quite, again, quite astounding. Um, and obviously you guys can't do anything about that. but if they are having a lot of soft drink at school or soft drink regularly, um, and certainly these energy drinks, then I think that's a battle worth picking. This is just something, just for your information, I'm not sure if you've seen it before, but it's actually really a really nice interactive. If you just Google sugary drinks calculator, what you'll get is this screen. You input your age and weight and height, and it takes you to another screen which you choose how many sweet drinks. So it might be a fruit juice, it might be a flavoured milk, it might be a soft drink that you might have in a week. Then it flicks to the next screen and shows you how much sugar you have, how much weight you could expect to have, gain in a year if you ate that drank those every week, and how much activity you need to do in order to burn it off. So it's a really nice way of demonstrating to kids and to yourselves in an interactive fashion. So keep that sugary drinks calculator in mind to have a look at it later. That one's not going to. All right, this one is something that's really close to my heart. Um, it, it might not be something that you see a lot of, although looking at that poll, it seems that there perhaps is some dieting and food restriction going on. This is a real concern. So if the child is overweight, dieting and restriction is absolutely not appropriate. I, this is a busy slide and I'll apologise for the busyness but I really wanted you to get the impact of these statistics because there is 90% of our female kids, 68% of the, of the guys uh, have been on a diet of some kind. And the only thing that high frequency dieting and early onset dieting give you a poorer physical and mental health more disordered eating, extreme body dissatisfaction, and more frequent general health problems. And in fact, down the bottom, dieting is the single most important risk factor for developing an eating disorder. So if you have kids who are, you, you even perhaps it might even be coming from the parents, um, so no, you can't have this, and no, we're, not, we're gonna skip lunch, or that kind of thing, that sort of behavior with, is a slippery slope to dieting and weight cycling and really disordered eating. So that to me would be a real red flag that might need so it might need some dietitian input, but it might also definitely need some flagging with the parent to say, you know, this is possibly not the best way of going about it. I know one of the boys in my my son's class, you know, is 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 against wheat and he's on a modified wheat diet and he's only allowed wheat on the weekends as a treat and that's really, really unhelpful and setting up a whole lot of different things. So this I could go on about for quite some time but I won't. It's just please if you are concerned that there, that someone in your class is restricting food then that, that that's a red flag. Okay. When we're talking about nutrition information, it's about giving them all the barrels. So pop it into your curriculum, put it into your newsletter and out through your social media. It's important with role modelling. Uh, I mean, Adam was saying at the very beginning that, you know, school... ...their development. So teacher role modelling good eating behaviours um, is, is not only going to benefit teachers' health, but, but also reinforce to the kids that what they're hearing at school is actually, you know, 
my teachers doing it and teachers know everything don't they so do all the right things so it is about and even if it gives them a contrast to what's happening at home that's possibly a healthy thing too so even if this kind of information is coming through in your parent information evenings or your prep information evenings mobilizing the kids so encouraging conversations at home that they might have about trying a new vegetable or bringing that kind of trying a new vegetable back into the classroom so theme days and things like that but the more information you have out there then the conversation with parents over any concern that you have is going to be easier because you can say did you see the information we put out on Facebook you know we did something about you know healthy lunch boxes did you see that so it's going to be a nice conversation starter so when we're talking now about where you get good information from Here's a couple of um, reputable sites that you can um, check out either on the recording or obviously you can have a brief look at them now. You will obviously be very aware that there is so much information out there, but a lot of it is not evidence-based. So these are some websites which you can refer to to actually just check in that the information that you think is right is, is actually correct. because. I think with all the information we do have access to, people are getting more confused about what healthy eating is, not not less. So I think it used to be simpler than it is now. So make sure that where you go is some reputable sites. So just a bit of a recap before we get into the conversations. Healthy diets do enhance learning and academic performance. So it is a relevant issue for schools to be involved in. Packaged foods are, are certainly a big problem, but energy drinks and beha dieting behaviours perhaps are worse. But when we're thinking about these um, conversations that we have with parents around probably packaged foods and lunch boxes, that we can get some good information and, and these will probably be the conversations we're more likely to have. Getting information out there, that will assist these difficult conversations. So let's have a little bit of a look here. So what we've got is there's a few different types of conversations. So we've got a positivity axis, axis and a time axis. So if you're trying to have a difficult conversation in a short period of time, it's perhaps not going to work so well. Because if you're looking at um, a short period of time and, and t sort of tackling a difficult conversation, it may well come out as scolding. Or if, even like if it's praise and it's on a short period of time, it's a bit of a throwaway line so you can't actually expect much of an outcome from a very short conversation. And can I ask you to think about this too? Research is actually showing from looking at doctors and nurses, it shows clearly that if the, if the patient can relate to them better and feels understood, they are more likely to implement that healthy behaviour. So if you think about your own experience with doctors and specialists and go, hmm, okay, what were the good ones, what were the bad ones, um, it's a similar position with parents and you guys because you as teachers and certainly as assistant principals and principals are authority figures. So it is, it is worth acknowledging that you are an authority figure and that any short negative conversation is going to come across as scolding. So it's worth putting the time in. And certainly, again, on this positivity, the positivity scale too, you know, you, you need to, if you're going to actually encourage any behaviour change, that it needs to be encased in some positive things. So we're having a little bit of a look here. If you're coming across as preaching, so this is going to take a long time, but be reasonably negative to be going, well, I've noticed that there's not very good stuff in your 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 child's lunchbox and it's not going to be uh, having a great effect on their, and their behaviour is da-da-da-da-da. So this comes across very much as preaching and that is not going to get you the outcome that you need. Again, if you're just going to give it a short period of time, you really shouldn't put that stuff in there is again not going to come out, this is where you're going to get your more violent reactions from people because it's about, you know, they, they are going to more cement in their bad behaviours rather than open up to any possibility of change. Praising is really good, um, but again, it's this, when we're talking about difficult conversations, there's clearly something that we need to put in place there. So when you're thinking about praising, it's almost about that positive sandwich so you can start with praise and then be talking about how you what 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 the issue you actually really want to see.
But of course, when we're thinking about the most productive conversations, and particularly for difficult ones, it's it's an approach of collaborating. So it's it, they're taking a bit longer time, but they're around positivity and more importantly, empathy. So how can we decide what we want to do together here? What what given that what's happening for you? How can we? So it's a whole it takes a whole different slant on it. So we're looking a bit more at these collaborative. Conversation. So you may want to run it past a colleague. You may want to run it past. You know, check your information. <coughs> excuse me. Check your information on some of these more reputable reputable websites to make sure that you're not giving them a bum steer on where they need to be nutrition wise. Decide on what you want the outcome to be. What's the point of having it? So, if you're concerned that the child's um, concentration is really lack lacked in the morning and energy levels are low and want to see if they have breakfast, you're thinking they don't, then your outcome is you know, I want to actually help this mum provide a breakfast, a healthy breakfast for their, for their child so that we get a good uh, outcome academically. So decide, what do you want to actually be the outcome? Arrange the meeting and then we look at acceleration and collaboration. So. How are you doing? If you're not looking at this, you get if you're just asking them how are you, then you're going to get some insight into how things are going at home. So if anything's wrong, then you're going to get understand it there. So it could be someone's been ill or there's been some stress. You know, if you know that, then you can come in from a more empathic position and go, yikes, okay, got to tread a bit more carefully. So just a simple thing like how you're doing is going to actually get a nice entry into the conversation. Looking at bringing it home, this takes the focus away um, you know, back from school to home. So I've noticed that, that Johnny's doing some excellent work with his reading. Have you seen that at home? And they might actually sort of say yes or they might say no, he's a nightmare at home. And again, this all opens up some conversations to bring the link between school and home and how it's relevant to you. So keeping it relevant is when you're articulating the problem, don't say what's well, going to impact on his weight because that is not your concern. That's the parent's concern. But when you're articulating the problem, it's about his performance at school or his behaviour at school is impacted. So this is where you do have the authority to comment and that's what makes it, it does make it your business and your concern. And of course, being in their shoes, looking at empathy, showing that you're interested in their problems and their issues, and that you're not judging them. So this is going to come a much, much stronger position to come from in, in towards getting to your outcome. I'm just going to show you a little bit what it might be. So hi, thanks for coming. Just wanted to check in to see how things are going. And blah, blah, you'll get a bit of information back from there. Timmy's going really well. I've noticed a really big improvement in his writing. Have you seen this at home too or he's concentrating more? And yes, I have seen it. But what I'm actually a little concerned about is, so he seems a bit distracted in the morning or, or perhaps it's the afternoon and that's going to have an impact on to, you know, if it's the afternoon, it could be what's in his lunchbox. If it's the morning, it might be around breakfast. So this is keeping it relevant, bringing it into your, your, your domain. So is this issue with food causing any problems at home? Is he a fussy eater or is he not going to bed on time? Is that what about the breakfast thing? So is it causing any problems for you or anything that, because again, it's about going, I care if it's causing a problem for you as well. So it might be a summary. So going to bed late means he's skipping breakfast, being grumpier to you and I'm seeing a decrease in, con on, in concentration. So is there any way I can help you with this? And can I suggest? And here where you're going, yeah, this is what your outcome is, or, or you might have revised the outcome if you, because now that you know what's going on at home. So it's a process whereby you're looking at how can I check that's what's going wrong, but have an outcome I'd like for the child, but at the same time not be attacking the parent, but really be coming from that real point of empathy. So. Adam, that is me, a done. So I'm really interested if anyone's got any comments or questions. So I've got one down here. It's got anyone else wondering if their daily multi multivitamin might need to be replaced by a krill oil, or krill oil capsule. You know what? Yeah, I think that that is a, a, a thing that 
might be worthwhile. This that research was it was done on women over a long period of time, and it showed by the time they got to seventy, they had way poorer outcomes um, than those than those women that just had a healthy diet or just even didn't have the multivitamin. So. So definitely the, the krill oil or the fish oil, there's, there's again, there's no real evidence that one's better than the other. So that, that's certainly um, an important one. Is there any other questions? Lisa, I'm back we'll... online now. If you, can you hear me okay there, Lisa? I can. Yep, absolutely. Good, good one. Look, we are certainly starting to run out of time here. I've been sitting here tracking people's engagement and one of the things that I that I certainly see, I don't, I don't really know how GoToWebinar does it, but it tracks people's uh, attentiveness and engagement. And when you started to talk then about how to actually talk to parents about it, it went through the roof. So thank you so, so much for that. I guess what I'm interested in here is how can how can people find out more from you? What can they find? How can they you know, get some more information to be able to take back to their schools? Mindful as I am that we've got so many people in teaching and support roles with us today. Yeah, yeah. Look, basically what I'm happy to do, um, I've got a, um, a, a system where I put out a sort of just really short nutrition articles if anyone is interested for their school newsletter or their social media. Um, that again, it, it can help. Again, coming from an accredited practicing dietitian, it, it demonstrates a care for nutrition and, and, and evidence-based nutrition information. So if anyone wants to take up on that offer, then certainly just let Adam know or certainly you can email me. So it's lisa at bodywarfare.com.au. I just send those out to people on a weekly basis and people can use them as often or as um, infrequently as needed. I think uh, the newsletter ladies find them quite useful for fillers there. But if anybody is interested in certainly any um, information around teacher health, around for PD days or any of the parent information initiatives, then, then certainly I'm happy to have a chat to people around that as well. So my mobile number is there as is my lisa at bodywarfare.com.au email. Lisa, we have a bit of a habit on our webinars of even if people have seen something on the screen that they find useful that uh, that they might be able to get their hands on the slides. If people use the chat box here to put slides, if they put the right the word slides in the chat box, are we able to maybe send them the PowerPoint that you've used today so that they can take those key messages back? Yeah, yeah, no problems. All right, so just remember that everyone, if you're online today, if you go to the chat box now and put the word slides in there, then what we're going to do is make sure that you get a copy of everything that Lisa's presented today. So, uh, you know, don't don't miss that opportunity to uh, to make sure that you put something either in the question box or in the chat box. And, um, you know, I don't know if you can see the question box, Lisa, but bang, 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 bang. We've got people in there saying, yep, yeah, we want that. We want that information. And it's people from all over the country, which is really exciting. Cool. So uh, I, think you've, I think you've hit on a really, uh, a really pertinent topic for us today. Lisa, is there anything else that you reckon we need to know to finish off? What would be the big message that you want to you know, give us to finish off today? I guess the biggest message is that, that eating well has such a great impact on your ability to think clearly, your ability to live well and live long. So the message is definitely for your students but also for yourselves that you know it's, it's worthwhile investing a little bit of time into getting some healthy practices and some healthy knowledge, definitely worth an investment. All right, Lisa. Well, thank you so, so much. I certainly uh, am very pleased that we got you on today because I don't reckon I could have done that kind of information any justice at all. I just sat down writing down uh, a handful of the things that I certainly personally need to, need to sharpen up. So um, <laughs> I'm very, uh, very happy to have been in participant mode today. So thank you so much for everything you've done today. I just want to really quickly let everyone in the community know that um, the next webinar we're going to do is our school leadership one, and we're actually getting another expert in. So we're getting Michael Lyson Blatty. In, who's a respect? Who's an expert on resilience? And this time, we're not talking kids; we're talking us. So this is for school leaders who might be interested in looking at how they can build resilient staffs and how they can build resilient teams. And so we're going to make sure that uh, when you get the follow-up email from this webinar today, that you get hold of the of just how you can get uh, involved in that um, in that in that really important webinar for school leaders or for anybody that's aspiring to be a school leader and might like to jump on that one. Uh, but about 
how we can be the ones that are resilient, how we can look after ourselves and we can be the ones that bounce back in difficulty because uh, there ain't no doubt that this is a difficult job and uh, you won't get a more difficult time, I reckon, than around, than around June. So thank you so, so much to everybody who's jumped online today and, um, and has participated in the webinar. And even if you haven't and you're one of the people that's listening to this webinar or watching this webinar on YouTube afterwards, we thank you for taking the time to do so. Thank you again, Lisa. Thank you, Chris, for all the work you've done behind the scenes, making this go really well. And we're going to uh, we're going to sign off there and say goodbye and uh, wish you all a wonderful mid semester break. So have a really have a real cracking time. You've all you'll all deserve a break, and we'll see you back in semester two for our next webinar on uh, on resilience resilience and resilient teams. Okay, bye for now.